Okay, so we're gonna go through the cranial nerves, one to 12. And this is a, a moment to stay calm. Drink tea, you could possibly drink coffee, but stay calm. Um, it's, it's not so bad. So that, that's what I'm gonna try and, and illustrate for you. So here are the 12 uh, cranial nerves. They have Roman numerals from one to 12. The most rostral ones, uh, the most rostral one is one, and the most caudal one is, is uh, 12, sort of. Uh, it goes from rough rostral to caudal uh, uh, order. These two come out of the forebrain, the telencephalon and the diencephalon, and the remainder come out of the uh, brainstem with the, po with the exception of the spinal accessory that comes out of the spinal cord. But these are the three through 12 are typically the ones that we call brainstem cranial nerves. We're gonna go through all of them. So some of them are complicated, but uh, there are a few easy ones. So let's start with the easy ones. Um, olfactory, it's a special sense. We're gonna say special sense. And what does it do? Okay, it carries olfactory information in from the nose. Really, really, really lovely. Optic, another special sense. What does it do? It carries optical information in from the eyes. Great. Uh, another one that's pretty simple, slightly more complicated, the vestibulocochlear, which is cranial nerve eight. Special sense, but in this case, two special senses, both located in the inner ear. So the inner ear has both hearing, subserved by the cochlea, and also uh, vestibular sense, which is where your head is in space and how it's moving in space. And that's um, the vestibular, which comes out of the, uh, the, vest the vestibulum of the inner ear. So the special sense from the inner ear. So that's, that's great. Um, now we have uh, a couple of um, motor ones that are simple. The trochlear uh, is motor to an extraocular muscle extraocular muscle to one extraocular muscle um, that has a complex, complex action, which we'll talk about. The, it's, the name of the muscle is the superior oblique. Superior oblique. Um, and then um, abducens is also uh, motor to one extraocular muscle. Uh, again, equals one, and this is uh, the lateral rectus. So the lateral rectus is the muscle, is a very important muscle, which allows you to look away. And in fact, I just learned that abducens, Latin is, uh, it, abducens is Latin for lead away, lead away. So, um, so to look to the side, this eye, when this eye looks to the side, it's using the lateral rectus, which pulls the eye to the side, abducts the eye. Um, the next fairly simple um, uh, cranial nerve is spinal accessory. This is motor. Uh, there are two muscles that it innervates, and that is um, the sternocleidomastoid and the trapezius. And what we'll see is the trapezius is going to allow you to do this, shrug, and sternocleidomastoid is allow, allow you to do this. I think of these as communicative uh, muscles. So they, they don't allow you to speak, but they do allow you to communicate. Both of these are, are very highly communicative actions or, or gestures. And then there's the hypoglossal. Um, I don't know how many tongue muscles there are, but um, all of the tongue muscles are innervated by the hypoglossal. So that takes care of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven out of 12 are, have one or, or one group, highly related group of functions. All right, so we're really only left with five uh, slightly annoying ones. And uh, two of them, two of the five that we're left with are, are relatively easy. So let's go over those. The ocular motor. It has motor to four extraocular muscles plus the levator palpebrae. The levator palpebrae is the, um, 
is the uh, voluntary eyelid muscle. Remember that the eyelid has two muscles, the superior tarsal, which is a smooth muscle controlled by thoracic spinal cord, and it also has the levator palpebrae, which is a skeletal muscle controlled by the ocular motor uh, nucleus going out through the ocular motor nerve. Okay. In addition, it has an autonomic con component. And that autonomic component does a few things. It, um, it dilates the pupil and it reshapes the lens, a process that is known as accommodation. which I probably spelled wrong incorrectly. Okay, so ocular motor has two components. It has a motor component and an autonomic motor component, but highly related, all to do with the eye. Okay, trigeminal has somatosensory, not special sensory, but typical sensory coming in from face and oral cavity. And it also has um, motor output to the chewing muscles. Now, before we go on, I have to tell you one thing about these motor, these motor, um, motor neurons. They are branchial motor neurons. They innervate structures derived from the pharyngeal arches. So. Um, that has importance uh, in development and it has importance in, in evolution. But the, these branchiomeric muscles and the branchiomotor motor neurons are in the adult are indistinguishable from the ones derived from somites. So, for example, let me, let me just make that clear. There are... Um, somatic motor neurons, and examples of that are like hypoglossal, biceps, etc. And there are branchial, and these are uh, the muscles of, of cranial nerve 11, um, uh, the chewing muscles, the middle ear muscles uh, and muscles of, of um, facial expression. So we're going to keep track of who's branchiomeric. And th these chewing muscles are branchiomeric. That just simply has some, um, uh, it, it helps us with understanding the central anatomy, OK? But uh, for right now, uh, just indulge me and, and realize that these, these chewing muscles are branchiomeric. So the uh, sensory information coming in to trigeminal and uh, chewing, motor chewing going out from trigeminal, not particularly, not highly related, um, but, uh, but, but relatively simple. So that, that's it. Now we have three difficult um, uh, nerves. And uh, I think we'll go over to the slides um, to look at these where I've, I've already prepared them because I've lost room. I have no more room here. OK. So here, here's a list um, that you can study on your own of all of the uh, cranial nerve, their numbers, their common name and what components they have, uh, as well as where they exit or enter from. So olfactory is from telencephalon. Optic is from thalamus. Um, oculomotor and trochlear are from midbrain. Uh, and the rest are from hindbrain, except for the spinal accessory, which exits from the cervical spinal cord. OK. OK, we've gone over all of this. All right, so we have, we have, we have um, three annoying cranial nerves, facial, 
glossopharyngeal, the, the really annoying one, and vagus. So each of them has either four or five different components, a somatosensory component, a branchial motor component, a parasympathetic outf autonomic outflow component, a special sensory component, not, not olfaction or vision, which we've already seen, but taste in this case, um, and also a viscerosensory. Viscerosensory uh, refers to information that's coming in from the viscera. And in this case, it's, it's information such as oxygen saturation or blood pressure. Um, okay, so let's just get started. We'll, we'll, we'll go through uh, seven first. Seven, had, it's known, it's most known for its branchial motor innervation of the muscles of facial expression. And that is absolutely critical, and we'll go over that later. There's a fairly common uh, sporadic uh, infection that, 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 that causes what's called um, Bell's palsy. And the, tip, the thing that tips a person off to the fact that they have a problem is they can't move half their face. They wake up one morning, they can't move half their face. That's not going to work for, for people. They're going to go see a physician if that happens. And so we really need to go um, into detail about uh, the facial nerve. Okay. So there's also a parasympathetic component that, go, that supplies uh, um, preganglionics to the ganglia that provide, um, uh, that, that provide salivation and lacrimation and, and moisture to the nasal cavity, et cetera. There is a weird thing where this, the ear, you would think the ear is pretty small, the trigeminal nerve could take care of it. It takes care of the rest of the face. No. For whatever reason, the ear is divided up between four different nerves. So a piece of the ear travels in seven. A piece of the ear, uh, somatosensory information from a piece of the ear enters the hindbrain through cranial nerve seven, the facial nerve. And finally, there's information from the front two-thirds of the tongue that enters uh, through the facial nerve. So this is a real uh, conglomerate of functions. Nine, um, I'll just put this up here. You can, you can study this on your own. It, nine is, is, um, is mostly, th I would recommend you mostly think about this as an extension of, of 10. There aren't that many uh, traumas that are going to selectively affect 10 without 9 or vice versa. So um, they're, they're very, they're very um, this is very small, and it's, uh, um, it's sort of uh, less important than its, its large neighbor. OK, so he, let's go into Vegas for a little bit more uh, deeply, there's branchial motor to the upper airway muscles. These are airway muscles that allow you to do things such as cough and swallow and speak. And uh, so interruption of this is, is a big deal. There is parasympathetic outflow to the body viscera above the hindgut. Okay? And there is somatosensory input from the ear, from the posterior meninges, the meninges that cover the, the um, brainstem, and, uh, that cover the brainstem. And there's also somatosensory input from the pharynx. There is special sensory input from the uh, taste buds of the pharynx. And there is viscerosensory input from the, from the body viscera. This, is, this vagus nerve, the cranial nerve 10, is a very large nerve. And it is a autonomic colossus. It has a ton of viscerosensory information coming in, and it has the bulk of the parasympathetic outflow to the body, uh, or all of the parasympathetic outflow to the body, the bulk of the autonomic outflow to the body, uh, to the viscera. So uh, what's interesting about this, and we'll come back to this in a minute, is that if you have a problem with the vagus nerve, the typical symptom is not the, the, the democratic one. So the democratic one, if you were voting with number of fibers, you would say that you would predict that you would have parasympathetic 
or autonomic problems from a vagus nerve lesion. But the most uh, striking problems that we have with a vagu vagus nerve lesion are related to the branchial motor, the control of the upper airway the inability to have a gag reflex, to have cough, the interruption of a cough reflex, and the interruption of swallowing and, and, and speech, which are called dysphagia and dysarthria, and we'll come back to that. Okay, so that is, that's an introduction to, the deficit, to, to all the cranial nerves. Um, I suggest you go back and you make lists that are the easy ones, the one component ones, the two component ones, the multiple component ones, I also may suggest that you make lists of the sensory ones and the branchial motor ones and the motor ones and the autonomic containing ones. You should make these lists in every sim symbol, single way that you possibly can think of. So you know them this way, you know them that way, and, and um, you've got to get this information down cold. So just work on your own to master this material. Great. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go through, we've started to do this, we've started to talk about what are the deficits that you would have if the different um, uh, cranial nerves were lesion. Now we're going to go into that systematically. Sure.